Dozing at the controls. Uh, I'm getting too old for flying. <laughs> Jerry? Jerry! Oh, sorry, Captain. I didn't hear you. You were sleeping. No, I wasn't. It's these headphones. Uh, where's Mac? Oh, back in the saloon, trying to impress Miss Coe. My instructions about fraternizing with passengers are being ignored as usual. Do company employees count as passengers? No wonder we're going broke with air crews like you lot. Go and prize him loose. Right. Tell him what should be the Kent coast is coming up. And would he have any objections to doing a spot of navigation? We were about to take off when a bunch of those national socialists came aboard waving their armbands and searched the aeroplane from nose to tail. Did they say what they were looking for? Oh, sorry to butt in. Uh, Skip's lost. He's wondering if the navigator might do some navigating. You see, Miss Cole... Without my guiding hand, we'd be charging all over the North Sea. Yeah, I didn't want to tell you in front of our passenger, but we are. <laughs> oh, well, better get us back in course, I suppose. Not that it will do me much good. Mm, I know how he feels. In what way? Empire Airways going broke. Oh. Uh, mind if I sit down? No, oh, it's your aeroplane. Uh, how long have you been with Empire? Nearly four years now. I started at the Croydon office, did a couple of years there, and then I was sent to Berlin. I had to leave after only 11 months. I was transferred to Paris. Paris was marvellous. Yeah. Mm, it's a pity it didn't last. <laughs> like all good things, I suppose. Why did you have to leave Berlin? The aerodrome manager there is one of those national socialists. They don't like Jews. They were even boycotting Jewish shops. I was glad to get out. We had some trouble with them recently. Mac but... was just telling me. Ah. Mm. Yeah. Still, now that they're boss, this Hitler chap's been made Chancellor. He'll be able to make them toe the line. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I suppose so. Yeah. What'll you do when we get back to England? Oh, I, I honestly don't know. We'll spend Christmas with my parents and then join the millions of unemployed. <laughs> what will you do? I could take you out to dinner. <laughs> well, that was so clever, I can hardly refuse. Right. <laughs> What about Mac and Captain Mason? I thought just the two of us. <laughs> I meant what will they do about jobs? Oh, Mac will be all right. He's going back to his father's farm in Scotland. Oh. I don't know about Skip. He must be getting on for 60 now. Yeah, he won't find it easy. No. Oh, it's good of him to fly me home. It's the first time I've had an Argosy and its crew all to myself. With all this Christmas mail, I don't suppose we get off the ground with passengers on board. Anyway... People can't afford to fly anymore. This is the last flight of the Star of Paris, is it? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No, oh, I needn't be. There are compensations. Oh? Well, it's given me the chance to talk to you. <laughs> You're worse than Mac. Yes. <laughs> May I call you Esther? Yes, of course. Jerry, lad. Skip wants you. OK. Has he uh, been annoying you, Miss Cole? Oh, we've been commiserating with each other. One jobless person to another. Aye, well, he's got a job at the moment. OK, OK, I'm coming. Back in a moment. Esther. <laughs> oh, aye. It's Esther now, is it? Can you tell my back for a minute? Oh, come on. Skip wants you to contact Lim and find out about conditions at Croydon. There's a lot of low cloud ahead. Hello, Lim. This is Empire Airways Star of Paris calling. Over. Hello, Lim. Can you hear me? Over. Oh, come on. Hello, Lim. Star of Paris calling. Can you hear me? Over. Come on, Jerry. Lim not answering, Captain. Oh, don't be silly. Try them again. Yes, Captain, of course. Well, get on with it. Hello, Lim. This is Empire Airways Star of Paris calling. Over. Oh. Hello, Lim. Are you receiving me? Over. Uh, it's no use, Captain. Maybe they're having their Christmas party. Oh, keep trying. I must know about conditions at Croydon. Hello, Star of Paris. Oh. Can you hear me? Over. That's them. Hello, Lim. What's it like at Croydon? Over. Hello, Star of Paris. Will you change the correct frequency, please, and repeat your identification? Over. No wonder they didn't answer. Why aren't you on the right wavelength? Well, I am, I am. I'll try again. Please do. Hello, Lim. This is the Star of Paris bound for Croydon from Orly. Hello, Star of Paris. This is Dunshill Federal Air Base. 
Can you verify your destination, please? Over. Duns Hill Air Base? There's no RAF station at Duns Hill, is there? No, of course not. Only a flying club. They haven't got wireless. What the blazes are you messing about at? We're nearly over the coast, and that cloud's straight ahead. This is Duns Hill calling the Star of Paris over. Hello, Duns Hill. Star of Paris receiving you. Your message not understood. Will you repeat, please? Over. Look here. A huge chap's drunk or something. There's no airport at Troyton that hasn't been since the war. Please keep your registration letters. Over. What the hell are they talking about? Can you contact Croydon direct from here? Well, I'll try. Got him, sir. That's him coming in at the top. And what range is the radar on? Intermediate, sir. I'd put them about 10 kilometres due south of Dunge Nests at 1,000 metres. And what's that trace there? An ME 124, scheduled flight to Berlin. And that must be Pilot Officer Cash. Well, he's closing fast. Is he reporting? Yes, sir. Right. Switch on the speaker. Located him on our radar. We're 800 metres above him and on the same course. Sharp thinning. There he is. I don't believe it. It's a giant passenger biplane. A pre-war Armstrong Whitworth Argosy. Good Lord. Empire Airways painted on the sides. I'm running the camera now. His registration reads Golf Echo Bravo Lima Foxtrot. I don't think he's seen me. No, he's going into cloud now. Shall I keep after him? Okay. You'd better recall Cash. Yes, sir. He's got some pictures I'd like to see. Now, keep an eye on our friend and let me know if he nears commercial airspace. I don't want to notify London Airport just yet. Not until we're certain. Ground their Christmas traffic for nothing and there'll be hell to pay. No luck contacting Croydon, Captain. <sighs> I'm going to make trouble for someone when we get down. Damn cloud. I wonder how high its base is. Mac. Position coming up, Skip. Well, for God's sake, make it a good one. I want to drop 2,000 feet. We should be coming up to Hawkehurst. Hold this course steady and we'll be over Tunbridge Wells in ten minutes. Jerry, leave that wireless alone. Watch out for breaking the cloud. Right. I want a height estimate. I'm going to chance a 1,000 feet, Mac. Duns Hill? Yes. OK, I'll tell him. That was Fox Warren radar, sir. They've lost him, too. He's lost height and dropped below their radar horizon. Oh, we'd better call London Airport now. Most sophisticated radar in the world, and we can still lose low-flying aircraft in fog. I suppose we should notify Berlin, just in case Fox Warren do. 1,300 feet now, Skip. Uh, it's, it's no good, man. We could be even lower. I'm going up. We'll keep heading northwest till it clears. What's our latest? Break, Captain. Cloud's thinning down there. He's right. Looks as if it might be clear about 300 feet lower. How about height? Oh, not bad. About 1,000 feet. Oh, we'd better take it easy. There's some high ground around here. We'll, we'll go down 300. Ah, that's better. We're through. Uh, still a bit patchy. Uh, at least we can see the ground occasionally. Give me a position, please, Mac. Ah, well, that's easy enough. There's the A25. That high ground is Rygate. Well, I saw it. What is? The A25. I suppose it is the A25. Yes, yes, it must be. What's up, Mac? Got us lost again. That must be me. I thought I saw a building that wasn't there last week. Damn ground fog. Look! That jewel carriageway wasn't there last week. Oh, no, you, you must be mistaken, Matt. I'm not mistaken. That jewel carriageway wasn't there last week. Someone's been busy. Jerry, yeah. see if you can get him on the wireless now. Right. Hello, Croydon. This is the Star of Paris calling. Hello, Croydon. Over. I'm still not answering, Captain. Oh, well, it doesn't matter so much now. We've got some visibility. Can I go back and reassure Miss Coe? Eh? Hey? Oh... Go on, then. Typical. Oh, hello again. Oh, hello. What's happening? I thought we were just going to land. No, 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 no. Still a few minutes to Croydon. Oh. We couldn't contact anyone on the wireless to find out about our cloud conditions, so, uh, so we had to go lower to find out for ourselves. Is that dangerous? Well, it can be. It looks clearer now. 
Oh, that's because we're flying underneath the main cloud base. These patches we keep flying through and is, is ground fog. It's nice to see England again. It's been two years. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how things can change in two years? We're just discussing how things can change in a week. Jerry, up here, quick. As fast as you can. Coming. Excuse me, Esther. Yes, Duty yes. calls. Yes. Right, what's the trouble? Skip me think we're going insane. I've got something to show you. Here, take the glasses. So? Over there to starboard. What do you make of that? Oh, let's just take a look. It's an aeroplane. Oh, of course, it's an aeroplane, you blithering idiot. What sort of aeroplane? Well, hang on a sec, hang on, hang on. Oh, I've lost it now. No. It's got no engines. Well, that's something. Skip me thought we were going mad. Oh, clouds hidden it now. I never knew gliders came that big. I could even see a row of windows. I'd heard that the army were experimenting with gliders, but not the size of that one. Dryden in five minutes, Skip. Yes, I know I've never approached from this direction before, but whenever I catch a glimpse of the ground, everything looks a, a bit odd. Jerry, yeah? try getting the BBC. Yeah, that's an idea. Right, hold on. Uh, come on. Ah, oh, here we are. President Hitler's health is still causing grave concern. In a bulletin issued this morning from Berchtesgarten, his doctors stated that the president spent a comfortable night, Stop but they felt rubbish. that further visits by heads of federal yeah. European governments would be undesirable. The president, who is 83, was taken ill last Tuesday while addressing the European For Parliament. For God's sake, switch it off. President Hitler. Mac, this can't be Croydon. Look at those buildings. It's just like New York. Yes, we'll, we'll have to climb. Hold tight. Those buildings have been at least 30 stories. Where are we, Mac? Croydon, we must be. Oh, don't be so stupid. There, there's a city down there. Look at it. There must... There must be a film set. Yes, look. There's the air drill. But it looks all wrong, Mac. <sighs> it looks good enough for me. I've got to get this thing down before I start raving. No skip. Up. Up. Goal posts. Football posts? Who the devil put those there? What does it matter? They're there. And we damn nearly hit them. Will you please try and get the control tower on the wireless? No. No, forget it. God knows what's going to happen next. Let's, let's take her up and, and circle for a bit. <sighs> I need to think. Only 15 to 20 minutes fuel left, Skip. Oh, we could put it on that field over there. It looks clear. As this is my last flight with Empire Airways, and I'll be looking for a job, the last thing I want on my record is that I risk a perfectly sound, expensive aeroplane trying to land on someone's cabbage patch. But Croydon's out the question. I can see that. We'll go on to Heston and land at the Ferry Aviation Works. If we can't land there, then it's only a couple of miles to Hounslow. Satisfied? Sorry. Oh, it's, it's not your fault, Mac. I shouldn't have spoken like that. Don't worry yourself. I just said far worse. Thanks, Mac. Let's have a course for Heston. Excuse me, sir. Sergeant. Uh, either come in or go away. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Travers. It's uh, this signal we've just received from Dunsit Air Base. What about... Well, there's an aircraft heading our way. It's Sergeant, so a few more months at London Airport and you will discover that aircraft heading our way are by no means uncommon. I suspect those three-mile concrete strips attract them. Remind me to have them removed. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> but uh, this is no ordinary aircraft. According to Dunzill, it's a pre-war passenger biplane, an Armstrong Whitworth Argosy. Uh, further details available from the Air Registration Board headquarters in Berlin. Oh, there's a phone number for you to call, sir. Uh, extension 510. Then find someone who can speak English. English. Bloody cruds. I beg your pardon? Ah, Travers. London Airport, Heathrow Security. What the hell's the meaning of the signal from Dunshill about a UFO? Ah, yes. Uh, did Dunshill give you the registration G-E-B-L-F? Uh, yes. We think they must be mistaken. The aircraft assigned those letters does not exist anymore. Of course it exists. Dunhill say they've just taken some pictures of it. According to our records... Oh, they were our records. According to our records, GEBLF vanished 41 years ago on a flight from Orly to Croydon 
in 1933. Are you certain about those letters? No, of course I'm certain. I've got Dunsill's signal in front of me. Well, I have a copy of the 1934 inquiry report in front of me. An Armstrong Whitworth Argosy, belonging to Empire Airways, disappeared on a flight from Orly to Croydon in December 1933. It had a crew of three, a woman passenger, and was carrying one ton of Christmas mail. So, if this is some sort of joke between London Airport and Dunshill, we don't think much of it. We've better things to do than to turn out our archives on the say-so of some... <sighs> Bloody crowds. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Get under Dunshill and tell him we are being attacked by a squadron of pink elephants. I think you ought to have a word with the airport radar officer first, sir. He's on the line, waiting to speak to you. Says it's urgent. Well, skip so much for Heston. What now? I don't understand it, Mac. Acres and acres of Brussels sprouts. I'm going around to take another look. Skip, we've got five minutes fuel left. Maybe ten at the outside. We've got to land now. There's plenty of fields back there. I've told you before, we're going to land at a proper aerodrome. My record... Off to hell with your record. If we don't land now, you won't have an aeroplane left, let alone a record. I'm the captain of this aeroplane, and I say we land at a proper field. We're going to Hounslow. Oh, don't be a fool, man. What will we find there? More goalposts? More Brussels sprouts? We've done emergency landings before, and this is an emergency. If we crash and there's an inquiry, I'll tell them exactly... I know this aeroplane a lot better than you do. When those gauges show empty, there's still a good five minutes fuel left. That's for crashing. Yes, Captain, over there, landing strips. Oh, that's right. They look like concrete. They can't be landing strips. They're much too long. But they are, Captain, look. And that building must be the control tower. And there's some aeroplanes on the ground. Well, you look at the side of them. Just like that glider we saw. Oh, come on, Captain. That runway there looks clear. We can't possibly land here. It must be some sort of secret base. How could anyone hope to keep a place like that secret? We've only got to look at the size of those aeroplanes. My God, look at that one by the building with... with a swastika on the roof. Well, with a swastika, I'll take that one, alongside the road. Here we go. Ambulances are going east. Shall I stay with them? Well, they probably want to pace it as it lands. Turn off here and head for the top of the runway. Who do you reckon they are, sir? Film company, I expect. And whoever they are, they're for the high jump when they get down, assuming they're sober enough to make a decent landing. I'd never have thought that one aircraft could cause such a flap. Okay, this'll do. Right. Let's take a look. <clears throat> Looks like the ambulances are in position. There's a whole battery of lights flashing down there. No sign of our friends. Hold it. Piston engines. Th there it is. <laughs> anyway, he's not drunk. He's coming in straight enough. Right, Sergeant. He's certainly not drunk. <laughs> he's down. Beautiful landing. Probably his last for some time. All right. Let's get down to meet them. Sir. It may be a museum piece, but it looks in pretty good nick to me. Wave him to shut his motors off, Sergeant. Right. Got your gun handy? Yes, sir. Good. Keep it out of sight. Don't think we need it. They seem docile enough. Stand well back. Let them come out of their own accord. Oh, it's quite a fair-sized aircraft, sir. Who are Empire Airways? I've no idea. Oh, door's opening, sir. Where do you get those clothes? Good morning, sir. Are you in charge of this aircraft? Yes, I am. Would you please tell me where we are and uh, what this place is? How many of you aboard? Uh, there's four of us. Myself, my wireless operator, my navigator and one passenger. I'd like you all to step down and come with me, please. I've got 50 mailbags on board. I can't leave them until they're handed over to the postal authorities. Where are they consigned? Croydon. Croydon? Yes, Croydon Aerodrome. Are we, uh, are we in Germany? Have you all got your identity cards? Oh, we have our passports. What exactly is this place? What are all those gliders? Will you accompany me, please? My sergeant will ensure this aircraft is properly guarded. 
I'm sure you don't wish to add to the trouble you're already in. I'm sorry, but I'm not leaving the aeroplane with unattended mail. The others can go, but I'm staying until the mail's handed over to the postal authorities. Sergeant. Sir. Now, will you come? Well, I don't have much choice, do I? None at all. Now, if you don't mind climbing into the back of my wagon, we'll go over to my office for a nice little chat. You've all got quite a bit of explaining to do. Before we start, my name is Travers. I'm in charge of the security around here. We'll start with you, as you seem to be the ringleader. Name? Mason. Charles Mason. I'm a captain with Empire Airways and not a ringleader. All I want is your name. I've just told you. Your real name. That is my real name. You've got my passport in front of you. I was coming to that in a minute. And uh, now you, Miss... Esther Coe. I should reconsider that if I were you. Esther Coe sounds Jewish. Look here, Travers. What are we supposed to have done? Please be quiet. What about you? Gerald Kane, wireless operator. Hmm? And you? Andrew Stewart, navigator. Hmm. Now, I want you all to listen very carefully. I'm sure you must realise the serious trouble you're in. You've broken just about every aircraft movement regulation in the book. Now, look uh, here. And endangered the lives of innocent people by flying straight into a major airport without clearance. Lying to me won't help. You. I'd like to speak to your superior. We are not lying. Oh, but you are. I know you are, and uh, so do you. Now, listen. I don't mind a spot of entertainment now and again, but I'm likely to get bored very quickly, and when I get bored, I get extremely nasty. Bear in mind, I can easily check your story with every airport in Europe without asking any of you a single question. It means a great deal of trouble for me, but I'll get at the truth. Uh, if people make trouble for me, I can make trouble for them. So I suggest you answer my questions truthfully. But we don't see what sort of trouble it is we're in. Using false identification documents is a very serious offence, for one thing. That's absurd. There's nothing wrong with our passports. I can vouch for my crew and Miss Cole. Uh, nothing wrong. What do you take us for? Look at these passports. Here, look at them. <sighs> what can I say to you? Look, we're, we're sorry about flying in here, but we couldn't land at Croydon or Heston. We were getting low on fuel when we spotted this place. It's not marked on our chart, so I suppose I, I should have known better. Why? Well, this place is a secret base, isn't it? Oh, secret. Can't I get it through to you? The joke's over, finished. Tell me who you are, who financed this crazy scheme, and why. I'm sorry. Who built the replica? I'm sorry, I, I, I don't understand. I, I don't think any of us do. All right. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll leave you alone for ten minutes so you can reflect on the position you're in. Only remember what I said about me turning nasty. Hmm? Very nasty. Oh. You were right, Skip. We shouldn't have landed here. Uh, it's, it's too late now. What I can't understand is what's wrong with our passports. Yours is OK, isn't it, Mac? Ah, another year to run. Yeah, and mine. And mine too. And what did he mean about me being Jewish? He sounded like the aerodrome manager in Berlin. Mac, are we by any chance in Germany? There was that, that swastika painted on the roof of the hangar. Yeah, and the German cross on the side of the van. Oh, no, we're definitely in England. Besides, Travers is English, surely enough, and that sergeant. Yes, I suppose so. The only thing I can think of is that this place must be some sort of secret base. Well, even if it is, what's that got to do with our passports? <sighs> I don't know what to think. Shall I take a peep through the blind? I might see something that would give a clue as to where we are. No, better not, lad. Just in case this is a secret base. The less we know, the better. Yeah. There were no windows in the back of that van, do you remember? Yeah. yeah it was odd, wasn't it? And did you notice how quiet it all was? It was no odder than this office. Look at that telephone. If it wasn't for the dial, you'd never know it was a telephone. Yeah. I've never seen a grey one before. Oh, never mind that for the moment. I've been racking my brains and I'm baffled. Does anyone have any bright ideas? Well, I... I know it sounds silly, but... Do you suppose... Suppose what? I was wondering about... The date. It might not be. Oh, no, no, it's too silly of me. What's that? 
It's getting closer. It's passing overhead. I don't know. I think I'm going. It's all right, Liz. Look, I've got you. I'm, I'm sorry, but I... I think I know... Don't say anything, Jerry. Yeah? Go and get help, quickly. Uh, right. Where are your smelling salts, Mac? Oh, oh, oh. oh the door's locked. I'll try the telephone, then. That's it, Mac. Hold her head down. Right. Okay, oh. love, you'll be all right in a minute. Right. What the devil are you gawping at? This isn't a real telephone. It, it can't be. Now, don't be so stupid. Here, give it to me. But it can't be. It's as light as a feather. Shh, somebody coming. What's going on? Oh. What's wrong with the girl? She's been taken ill. I'll call the doctor. Uh, no. No, it's all right. I, I feel better now. That noise frightened me. What noise? Some infernal machine that passed overhead. What the devil was it, man? Are you sure you're feeling all right now? Yes, thank you. Well enough to answer a few more questions, I hope. Uh, Have you all thought about what I said? I think the best thing is if I give you a full account, starting with our departure from Orley this morning. Are you sure you left from Orley? Yes. What's that you're looking at? A list of all his morning departures. It's just come through on the teleprinter. What time did you take off? Oh, about 8.30. Uh, who owns your aircraft? Empire Airways. It's painted on the fuselage. You've got its papers. Have the authority to use the registration GEBLF? Well, yes, I, I suppose so. For film work? Well, we have been chartered for occasional film work, yes. I see. Is your aircraft a replica? A replica of what? An Armstrong Whitworth Argus. Oh, no, it is an Argosy. It's in good condition. Well, it's well looked after. It's our bread and butter. Uh, or was. Uh, Would you tell me what's happened to the mail we had on board? It's been handed over to the postal authorities here. I expect they're looking at it now. Thank you. And perhaps you tell us when and what we're to be charged with. <sighs> we're still writing the list. Is the mail in those bags? But of course, we have a contract with the post office. Mm, no wonder letters take such a time. Beg your pardon? Nothing. What happened after you left, Orly? It was an uneventful flight at first, until we tried to find out about conditions at Croydon. Croydon? Why Croydon? Because we wanted to land there. I thought you were going to be sensible. <laughs> Travers? Yeah? How many bags have you opened? All right, be right over. In all my years with the post office, Mr. Travers, I've never seen anything like this. I just don't believe it. Look at the postmarks. Look at them. Mm. Paris, the 12th of December, Limoges, the 10th, Orléans, the 12th, Marseille. Yes, but all 1933. Can I open this one? It's unsealed. Help yourself. And these bags were loaded at Orley this morning. Well, 1933, hmm? Yes, according to the air crew, that is. Crafty blighters. Who? The French. Unearthing this lot and thinking they could slip them through without us noticing. Do you know, last month two bags turned up. How will you deal with it? I'll have a special rubber stamp made up. Delayed in post by French mail. There'll be a hell of a row. You deliver it? We'll have a try. After 41 years? We have to, by law. It's the President's mail, and some of the addresses will still be valid. Mm, this one wouldn't be. Coventry. That's a total destruction area, isn't it? I'm not sure. I haven't seen a Coventry letter for some years now. I'll check the register. Um, no. Coventry's not total, only partial. What street? Boundary Lane. Boundary Lane. Yes, it was in a secondary fire zone, 1950. Addresses 1 to 49 odd numbers and 88 to 150 even numbers are all inoperative. Do you still get normal mail from abroad addressed to destruction areas? Not so much nowadays. We have a special department to deal with it. <laughs> They'll have fun with this bag here. Half the contents of a Birmingham. The only operative address there is the contamination monitoring station. You'll have to hold this mail. I can't. I was going to set up a special team for an initial sort. No, leave it for the time being. Keep it locked up till I give you the word. I'm sorry, but I've no authority to delay mail. I'll see you get the authority. It's important you leave these bags intact. They might be evidence. I'll have to consult my superiors first. Not until I say so. The less you know about this, the better. 
Has there been a crime? That is what I intend to find out. I've pacified the air registration board in Berlin, sir, and managed to get some more information out of them on that aircraft. Did you get the names of the aircrew? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. I didn't think you'd believe it. Right now, Sergeant, I'd believe anything, even this. Well, I don't understand it. I was beginning to think it was all one big practical joke, but this... Uh, how would you fake 100,000 postmarks and stamps on as many litters? <laughs> I don't know, sir. Oh, uh, the charge sheets are ready. Forget them for the time being. What sort of accommodation can we fix them up with? Oh, there's the cells. Mm, something more comfortable. I'll see what I can find. Good. Let me know when you have. In the meantime, I've got some more questions I want to ask our friend. Right, a few more questions, then uh, something to eat. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Travers, we uh, we want to contact our families. Uh, Miss Coe is anxious her parents should know she's all right. I usually telephone my wife, and uh, I've got to notify our Croydon office. Later. Now. It will have to wait. I insist we have a right. Right? Who the hell are you to talk about rights? You can't hold us without charges. Don't you believe it. This is England, part of the Third Reich. I can hold you as long as I like, and there's nothing you or all the civil liberties committees outside Europe can do about it. Mr. Stewart. Yes? When I came in, you were reading a newspaper. I'd like to see it, please. Are you accusing me of stealing a newspaper now? Mr. Stewart, I may accuse you of something a damn sight more serious than that. You've no right to... I've every right. And it's no good you going on about your rights because you haven't got any. None of you. You're all dead. Come in. Hang on, Sergeant. I'll come out. Well, putting some pressure on. A bit. Found some quarters. Now, the quarantine unit's free. Well, the medical people say we're welcome to it, uh, provided they can kick us out if an emergency crops up. Good. What's he like? Well, there's two wars that'll do nicely. The girl can have one, and the other is large enough for the men. There's a small sitting room adjoining. How's it fitted out? Several easy chairs, coffee table, television. Get rid of that. Radio? Yes. That too. Books, magazines? Uh, I'm not sure, sir. If there are, get rid of them. I don't want anything in that unit to connect the date too obviously with 1974. Is there a picture of Hitler on the wall? Oh, I expect so, sir. Take it down. Uh, but Don't you... argue with me. Take it down. Don't worry. If anyone asks questions, I'll say it was on my orders, OK? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to grab something to eat now. Leave our friends to sweat for a bit. When you've got the accommodation ready, back the van right up to the entrance here so you can bundle them in without them seeing too much. Oh, won't they think that odd, sir? I don't care if they do. Anyway, they already think this place is some sort of secret establishment. Now, I'm going to notify Berlin. I don't want to, but there's just the chance that the communists may be behind all this. I have to cover myself, so I want you to get onto the special branch headquarters in the Willemstrasse and give them a brief outline of what's happened. Shouldn't you do that, sir? Yes, but they'll attach little importance to an affair reported by a sergeant. I don't want this place crawling with krauts if I can help it. I shall expect a progress report from you by this evening. Uh, come in, sergeant. How are they? All nicely installed, sir. Uh, and they've had an evening meal. Mm. Did you notify Berlin? Uh, yes, sir. I spoke to Herr Muller. Mm. Well? I'm sorry, sir, but he seemed rather interested. How interested? He's flying out here tonight. Didn't I say I didn't want krauts under my feet? I think he's English. With a name like Muller? Uh, yes, sir. John Muller? Uh, Johann. Do you know him? Mm. I have a horrible feeling I do. John Miller. He and I trained together before the war. A dedicated national socialist. He threw in his lot with them after the Allied surrender in 1953. He changed his name to Miller. And he's on his way here? I'd rather deal with the crowds any day. He said he'd be in your office tomorrow morning at three minutes past ten. Oh, that sounds like Miller, all right. Make sure he gets the crack cup. Quite incredible, Travers. Quite incredible.
Tell me, do you believe them? Mm, there's these passports, the mailbags, the aircraft. You're evading the question. Do you believe them? I'm not sure. But you tell me you fixed up a room for them and removed all fittings that wouldn't be around in 1933. I said I'm not sure. And that's why you called us in? You called yourself in. Well, it's not every day an aircraft from the past turns up. One wonders what's going to turn up next. As you are here, it would be best if you saw the crew for yourself and formed your own opinions. Oh, I shall. I shall. I'm very curious about the crew. Especially this Esther Coe. Huh? Why her? Uh, what does her name suggest? Assuming that's her real name, what should it suggest? She's obviously a Jew. Why should that concern me, Miller? You lot. The president's anti-Semitic policy... No, I don't care a damn about a person's religion. My job's to enforce the law and to nab villains, be they Gentile, Jew, Muslim, or even National Socialist. In any case, the anti-Semitic laws have not been ratified in this country. You should have gone to Berlin, Travers. It's a fascinating place. One can keep an ear to the ground. The disadvantage of having an ear to the ground is that you put yourself in a favourable position for being kicked. I'd like to see the air crew now, please. Alone. Uh, I'll show you the way. Someone else. I wouldn't want to waste your time. Perhaps we could have lunch together. And that'll give you time to get some information together on their families. I usually lunch at the airport bowling alley. May I come in? We are not answering any more questions until my lawyer's present. I was hoping we might have a little talk. My name's Mo uh, Miller. John Miller. And you must be Captain Mason. Yes. This is Miss Coe, Secretary with Empire Airways, Andrew Stewart, Navigator, and uh, Gerald Kane, my wireless operator. Are you uh, senior to travellers, Mr. Miller? In a way, yes. You realise he's held us against our will and that we've not been charged with anything. We've not even been allowed to contact our families. All in good time, Mr. Mason. I have some questions I wish to ask you I'm first. sorry, Mr. Miller. No more questions. Do you speak for everyone? I think so. You're not certain? Well, of course, if the others wish to answer questions, I can't stop them. Good. May I speak to Miss Coe? If you wish. I wouldn't like to pose a threat to your authority. No, ask whatever you wish. Thank you, Captain Mason. I'll start with you. I said I would answer no more questions. You're happy to let Miss Coe answer them for you. Not very gentlemanly behaviour, Captain Mason. I don't mind answering questions, if it'll help. What do you want to know, Miller? You took off yesterday in your Argosy from Orly Airport. Aerodrome. Oh, yes, Aerodrome. Now, do you remember anything unusual about the flight? It doesn't matter how trivial it may seem. Well, just a routine flight until we tried to contact Lim. On your wireless. We've told all this to Travers. Is there anything you remember now you haven't told him? Anything at all? No? Do you believe us, Mr. Miller? Possibly, Miss Coe. What concerns me at this moment is whether or not the others will believe me. But I think you will. Am I right? I don't know what you mean. I think you do. No, no, don't, don't, don't turn away. Look at me, like you were just now. Leave her alone, Miller. I'll answer questions. Tell them about the date, Miss Cole. There's no don't need. interrupt. The, the, the date? What about the date? What about the date? Hugs down a dog. Well, could target it. I said enough of that. I don't know. Miller, leave her alone. No, she's got to tell you herself. Tell us what. Can't you see what you're doing? Tell Gemma? them the date. I can't. I, I can't. It's all right, Esther. Yeah, it's all right. Tell she can't them hurt. the date. I don't know the date. I don't know. You do. I don't. Is it 1950? It's East. Neunzehn, hundert, vier und siebzig. 1974. 74. I've been watching you play, Travers. Three strikes in succession. Quite good. It's easy, Miller. I pretend tin bins are German collaborators. And the machine always stands them up again. Until it breaks down, wears out, or is replaced by something better. How did you get on with our four Rip Van Winkles? False analogy. We know what happened to him, but we don't know what happened to our friends. Not even they do. You told them about the date? No. Esther Coe told them. She knew? She guessed. She didn't know the precise date, of course. And you still believe them? Of course. 
Don't you? It doesn't matter whether I believe them or not. It's your case now. Telegram from Berlin says so. Surely, the evidence... I think it would be better to go back to my office. I'd rather not discuss it here. Now, look, Miller. I mistrust any evidence that's rammed down my throat. Just because we haven't discovered a crime doesn't mean it hasn't been committed or is at least being planned. All I know is it must be something pretty spectacular. For instance? Uh -huh. It's your case now. You're expected to cooperate. Did you come up with anything on their families? Oh, yes. The one calling himself Mason hasn't learned his part properly. In fact, none of them have. Well? Did Mason tell you he was married? Yes. Well, he wasn't. It's impossible. Who told you this? My sergeant saw Mason's sister this morning. He must be mistaken. If it comes to a choice between my sergeant and the one calling himself Mason, I'd settle for my sergeant. That's something for you to think about. I'm not sure. I'll tell you something else. The girl, Esther Coe, remember the colour of her eyes? No. Brown. Her father's 85 now, but sharp as a razor. According to him, they were green. I see him. He does tend to throw a different light on things. He does. What do you suggest we do? I'm not suggesting anything. It's your case. But you're still involved. Especially if there's been... What was that phrase? Foul play. Mm. Either there has been or there's going to be. The best thing is to get an aviation expert to go over that aircraft with a microscope. Find out where and when it was made. Not only would it give us a lead, but it might give us the evidence we need to break their story. And where would we find such an expert? <laughs> Easily at Heathrow. Anton Barrett, Air Registration Board, Inspector with uh, General Aviation. He's a friend of mine. I'll, uh, I'll ask him over. There's the beast. What do you think? She's magnificent. Hardly my opinion of it. No, she really is beautiful. Do you know anything about old aircraft, Mr. Miller? Very little, I'm afraid. Oh, I cut my teeth on Argus's as an apprentice. I never realized biplanes were so large. You can give me an ME-124 any day. Ah, don't you believe it. You know, if anything went wrong with one of these, they looked around for a handy field, landed, put it right, and took off again. These things could land anywhere? Well, not exactly anywhere, but any reasonably flat field would do. This large wing area gave them plenty of lift at low speed. They didn't need about three miles of concrete. Interesting. Yes, so is this. Well, look at these fastenings. Locking wire. So what, they look like ordinary nuts and bolts? Yes, they are. It's the way they're secured, you see? Now, in the old days, when you screwed a nut into a screw or bolt and didn't want vibrations to shake it off, you drilled a hole right through the nut and the bolt and shoved a piece of locking wire right through the lock, just like this. So? Well, nobody will go to that trouble today. Even with a replica, they'd use self-locking nuts. They're less bother, cheaper, and more reliable. So, whoever built this replica was a perfectionist? No. Not if they wanted a certificate of airworthiness. I can't imagine any inspector being happy with holes drilled through the threaded fasteners when there are safer methods available. At least I know I wouldn't like it. Look, uh, can we go inside? Mm. Help yourself. All right, thanks. Up we go. It's surprisingly luxurious. Well, the Argosy was a luxury aircraft. One of the first. It's um, a bit cramped up here. I'll um, I'll try one of those seats and um, savour the atmosphere. Yeah. Hey, have you seen these charts, Travers? Yes, why? Well, there's a course laid off from Orley to Croydon, of all places. I shouldn't worry about that. It doesn't have any bearing on whether or not this aircraft is a replica. No, but it has considerable bearing on my curiosity. Curiosity is my job. And my failing. Where did this aircraft come from? I thought you'd tell me. Well, I know where it came from originally. I was wondering where it came from recently. Where? Where what? Look, Anton, where did this thing come from? Armstrong Whitworth's workshops. About 40 years ago. You're certain? Reasonably. That's not good enough. You'll have to be... Absolutely certain. Would you be prepared to stand up in court? Oh, and now swear? look, look, look! You asked me to have a look at this aircraft as a favour. You never said anything about going into court and giving evidence. No, all I'm asking is if you are sufficiently certain to repeat the same thing in court. Yes, I think so. You only think so. All right, then I know so. 
that this thing was built 40 years ago. About that, yes. It would never stand up. Why not? Because it wouldn't. Common sense alone. Travers, look, listen. This aircraft is an original. Now, don't ask me how it's been preserved. That's something I can only guess at, but it's not a replica. And it's not a restored airframe. It's a genuine Armstrong Whitworth Argosy. And all the smooth-tongued president's councils in the country can't change that. Look, look, you see, see that wiring? Mm. It's insulated with fabric. You can't even buy wire like that today. Well, couldn't it be made to special order? Oh, I, um, I found something rather interesting, Travers. What is it? It was under one of the seat cushions in the saloon. A London tram ticket. Tooting to Wimbledon. <laughs> Even the litters, period. Don't antagonise him. He doesn't like evidence. I never said that. I said I don't like evidence that's rammed down my throat. You can hardly say it's rammed down your throat when, in fact, it's rammed down the back of a seat cushion. Good morning, Mr. Barrett. Oh. I wondered if you had... Uh, changed my opinion? No, I've not. No, I didn't suppose you had. Did Trevor send you? It's not actually his case. He's only acting in an advisory capacity. Oh, I see. No, hell, I don't see. What case? I'll explain later. But first, I'd like your help. Well, I've a lot on my plate at the moment. It won't take long. Could the Argosy fly again? Well, if you could get hold of some petrol, it could, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to see one flying again. I'd like to see it flying next week. Or without petrol? Or a certificate? Maybe I could pull some strings. Look, if you want that aircraft flying by next week, you'll have to pull ropes. I don't suppose Travers will like it. <laughs> I don't expect he will. I think it's an excellent idea, Miller. A reconstruction of the crime. The classic ploy when you're sunk for leads and want to impress the newsboys. Of course, a good copper doesn't set up a reconstruction to test wild preconceived theories. I expect they'll enjoy it. They're good actors. You think so? Yes. Why? Mason's story that he's married, for one thing. Supposing our present isn't their future. And what's that supposed to mean? Have you ever heard of parallel time continuums? Vaguely. They're not the sort of thing likely to crop up in my daily routine. Or mine, at least not until now. It was you who made me think of them. The colour of Estico's eyes? Exactly. In 1933, in our past, an aircraft carrying four people disappeared. That we know to be true, but it's only true of our past. And our past isn't necessarily the same as theirs. <laughs> Try that one on a jury, especially one of your German Let's juries. Let's suppose they're not lying. Now, we know our air crew can't be the same air crew that disappeared in 1933. That's what I've said all along. And there must be an air crew that disappeared in another 1933, in another universe existing in separate time and space to ours. These people could be living proof of Nielsen's parallel time continuum theory. Then how do you explain the differences between their universe and ours? The colour of Estico's eyes, and even if you could, how could they have slipped into our universe in the first place? Have you ever read Nielsen's theory? Only what I've read in the papers. There was a bit in the Berliner about the possibility of one man having a million mother-in-law. I've just looked it up. Nielsen said that an infinite number of universes would lead to duplications. Impossible. Why? We're talking about an infinite number, remember. Why shouldn't there be duplication? Not perfect duplication, but near enough. There could be a world where there was no Second World War, or a world where the war ended with... The defeat of Hitler. <laughs> the defeat of Hitler. Well, when you find this world, tell me where it is, won't you? I'm on the lookout for somewhere decent to retire to. That sort of talk could uh, get you into trouble. Who brought up the subject? I'm trying to explain that each universe has its own pattern, like the holes in a punch card. And once, just once, the holes in one card lined up with the holes in another, and time slipped through. Carrying four people and a bloody great biplane with Yes, at some point during their flight from Orly to Croydon, the holes lined up. There must have been a precise moment when they were existing outside of time and space, a fleeting second of disorientation. And you hope to pinpoint this moment by reconstructing their flight? There's just a chance they may remember something if we recreate the original conditions. Uh, no one can say we're not exploring every avenue. I shall want the Argus's mail back. And we'll have to return their clothing and personal possessions. Everything must be exactly as it was in 1933. We won't even maintain radio contact. They'll fly along their 1933 route and call Lim on their radio just as they did in 1933. Mm. It's worth trying. So are they, in court. I was hoping you'd help with the arrangements. <laughs> I was hoping you'd ask. Good. 
How do we ship the Argosy to France? Easy. Air Cranes Limited say they can sling it under a helicopter and fly it straight to Orly. And when do our friends fly it back again? As soon as weather conditions are similar to those in 1933. They'll be plotted by radar. You and I will be on an air-sea rescue launch in mid-channel to enable us to watch the aircraft as they call Lim. And the whole affair's codenamed Operation Phoenix. I preferred it when we were moving. There wasn't this horrible rolling. They've gone, you know. No, I don't know. It's silly, sitting out here in the middle of the ocean. We'll doing... give them ten minutes. I'd give them ten years if I had my way. You're not having your way. And you're not having yours, are you? Ten minutes. Well, let's go back to Dover. I'll buy you a drink. Ten minutes. Nine now. Don't split hairs with me. I'm not in the mood. Now, you listen to me. Radio telephone for you, Helen. That's them. If you like, Miller, I'll eat my words, but I don't think I could hold them down. Be there yet, Captain. Oh, this should do. Stop engines. Let her drift. Radar? Sir? Anything? Yes, sir. Fuzzy echo, 30 kilometers. 303 degrees. Height, 1,000 meters. Good. Uh, Looks like she's bang on course. 25 kilometers, sir. Course steady. Height steady. Two degrees deviation, our position. Are you listening in on that shortwave frequency? Uh, so it's been on all the time. If they transmit, we'll hear them on the speaker. 21 kilometers. She's virtually on top of us. Visibility's worsening. Damn. The last thing we want is fog. If they should come down, we'd have a devil of a job finding them. With radar? Now look at that trace. It's fuzzy. That's because a wooden aircraft makes a lousy radar reflector. Uh, we'd never see her on the surface. Fog's thickening. 16 kilometers. Very fuzzy trace, sir. Deviation zero. Only a few minutes now. Well, very weak echo now, sir. I think I can hear their engines. Listen. Only ten kilometers, sir. But I'm losing them. Echo's fading. Why? Are they losing height? No, sir. They're just fading away. Hello, Lim. This is Empire Airways, Star of Paris calling. Over. That they're going, sir. They've gone, sir. Just gone. There's, there's nothing. Hello, Lim. Will you answer, please? Over. Hello, Star of Paris. Lim receiving you. Over. What's it like at Croydon? Over. Good. Visibility, two miles. Clouds, 3,000 feet. Wind, north nor east, 15 knots. Over. Thank you, Lim. Merry Christmas. Uh, Captain, weather conditions at Croydon are good. Visibility, two miles. North nor easterly blowing at 15 knots and cloud base at 3,000. Who was that? <laughs> Lim Aerodrome. You asked me to contact them. But they... they answer? <laughs> yes, Captain, of course. Why? I don't know, it's... Oh, nothing. I'm getting too old for flying. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) In The Doppelganger Machine by James Follett, Travers was played by Peter Pratt, the captain of the aircraft by Hector Ross, Jerry, Nigel Lambert, Mac, Hugh Ross, Esther, Eva Haddon. Muller was played by William Edel, the sergeant, John Sampson, Anton Barrett, Manning Wilson, and the post office official, Dennis McCarthy. Other parts were played by Julian Fox, John Foley, and John Bull. The producer was Roger Pine.